Commissioner Houseman participating by telephone. Yes, I'm here. Uh, a quorum is established. I'm going to call for approval of the minutes from a warm day in December uh, for a meeting that's a little chillier today uh, here in, in, in March. Um, so we're going to consider the approval of the minutes that you've all been received and you received them in the, uh, before this meeting, about our December 11th meeting. Are there any additions or corrections? There are none. I'm going to ask for a motion uh, to approve those um, uh, December meeting minutes. Move. Seconded. There's a motion and a second. Is all uh, approved? There's no approval. Is there a signify by stating aye, please? Aye. Aye. And ayes have it, and those minutes are approved. Um, how about uh, providing us with an executive breakfast report, Mr. Small? All right. First off, we'll start with uh, new hires. In legal, extern Rachel Keller. Rachel is an Indianapolis native who received her undergraduate degree from Indiana University Bloomington, where she majored in law and public policy. After five years in the payroll and employee benefits world, Rachel decided to follow her dreams and begin her law school career. Currently, she is finishing up her second year at IU McKinney School of Law. She joined the IGC as a legal extern in an effort to intersect her love for sports and entertainment with her love of public policy, and we really enjoyed having her. Thank you, Rachel. Clients, we have two new hires. First up, Jessica Welch. Jessica Welch is the current responsible gaming coordinator for the IGC. She enjoys helping people who are experiencing difficulties and is excited to learn more about the culture of casinos and gaming. She earned a BA from IUPUI with a double major in psychology and anthropology. She's currently enrolled in a music production class. Her work experience includes multiple code enforcement and office assistant positions for the Marion County Public Health Department, and most recently, five years as an administrative assistant with IDEM. She lives in Annapolis, enjoys spending time with her husband, chickens and cats, collecting geodes and fossils, and making DJ mixes of classic funk and, and disco music. Kyla Kipper. Kyla is a new compliance analyst joining the Indiana Gaming Commission. Kyla's background includes bachelor's degree from Indiana University in human biology and Spanish. With her, Kyla brings experience from a term of service with AmeriCorps, where she worked as a nutrition incentives operations specialist at the Marion County Public Health Department, and most recently from Ice Miller, where she worked as a legal services assistant in the government and regulatory law group. She resides locally in Broad Ripple with her partner, Julie, and two cats, Meatball and Vino. For fun, Kyla loves playing board games, online shopping, playing cornhole, and learning everything she can about everything. Enforcement, we had a promotion. Brock Pilgrim was promoted from assistant director to deputy superintendent of investigations, effective March 2nd. Um, we want to thank Brock for his uh, service, and uh, this is a well-deserved promotion for him. Investigation. Our investigations division has completed reinvestigations for licensees Hard Rock, Northern Indiana Casino, Beachy Properties, and Penn Sports Interactive. The confidential reports are in your materials. Director Brown is present should you have any questions. Since December 2023 business meeting, commission staff has added 18 individuals to the exclusion list now stands at 1,041 individuals. Waivers, the IGC has also granted 29 waivers to Indiana casinos since the previous meeting. This information is included in your materials and will also be posted on the commission's website. And lastly, um, I would like to report that the person who scheduled this meeting on the first day of the NCAA tournament <laughs> is uh, sitting right before you. Um, but uh, in my defense, I'm an IU fan, so I was not uh, really um, putting that date on my calendar. So I, I apologize to everyone for enduring. So thank you. And no office wagers. <laughs> that concludes my report. Uh, thank you. Um, you can continue on and administer the oath all those who are going to be presenting today. So stand and. I state your name. Hereby solemnly swear. 
Subject to the penalties of perjury. Subject. Tell the truth. The whole truth. Nothing but the truth. Help me, God. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Director. Um, Commissioner, for any old business, old business before the commission. On to new business. First, we have uh, patron matters. Attorney uh, Viola will now present the order 2024-01 concerning an exclusion uh, placement appeal. Good afternoon, commissioners. Good afternoon. Come on, counselor. Okay. There we go. <laughs> there we go. I won't touch it. <laughs> Commissioners, you have before you order 2024-01 concerning the exclusion list appeal of Mr. Bert Neff. Mr. Neff is currently on the exclusion list but submitted an appeal. A hearing was held with an administrative law judge and the ALJ's order confirmed Mr. Neff's placement on the exclusion list. Mr. Neff appealed the ALJ's decision. Pursuant to Indiana Code 4-21.5-3-29, the commission must now either affirm, modify, or remand the ALJ's order. Documents related to Mr. Neff's exclusion and his appeal have been provided to you in your commission materials. Approving order 2024-01 would have the effect of affirming the ALJ's order, which confirmed Mr. Neff's placement on the exclusion list. Is there a motion on order 2024-01? Or a second? Second. Motion on a second on the exclusion. Um, any call for a vote? All those in favor of the motion signify by stating aye, please. Aye. 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 Uh, all opposed, same sign. Hearing none, carries. Continue on, uh, Ms. Viola, uh, with the petition for removal of the exclusion list. Yes, thank you. Commissioners, you now have before you orders 2024-02 through 2024-04 concerning the petitions for removal from the exclusion list of Lakeisha Hudson, William Jefferson, and Hope Schuler. Petitioners have been placed on the exclusion list for over three years and have petitioned to be removed from the exclusion list. Telephonic hearings were conducted at which petitioners provided support for their petitions. Based on the totality of factors relevant in these matters, the reviewing officer has concluded that petitioners have met the standard of clear and convincing evidence as reflected in staff's finding of fact and recommendation. Adopting staff's findings and recommendations would have the effect of granting petitioners petitions for removal from the statewide exclusion list. Have questions about that? Motion to order is 2024-02 through 2024-04. Uh, I would entertain a motion. Motion to approve 2024-02 through 2024-04. There a second. 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 There's a motion and a second. <clears throat> Discussion? Hearing none, we'll call for the vote. All those in favor of the motions, signify by stating aye. Aye. Opposed, aye. Same, opposed same sign. Hearing <clears throat> none. Uh, the motion carries. Uh, license renewals, Mr. Neal. Good afternoon. Commissioners, you have before you order 2024-05, pursuant to Indiana Code section 4-33-7-8 and 68 IAC section 2-2-8. <clears throat> A supplier's license must be renewed each year along with the payment of a $7,500 renewal fee. Each of the following licensees has submitted a timely request for renewal along with the required payment. IGT, Halifax Security Incorporated, Zuvid LLC, Data Financial Incorporated, Incredible Technologies Incorporated, Score Media and Gaming Incorporated doing business as the score, Connections IT Incorporated, Interblock Luxury Gaming Products, TCS John Huxley Europe Limited, Genesis Gaming Solutions Incorporated, Amelco UK Limited, Sport Radar Solutions, Surveillance System Integration, LNW Gaming Incorporated, doing business as Light and Wonder, Patriot Gaming and Electronics Incorporated, and Mask Publishing Incorporated. Approving Order 2024-05 would have the effect of renewing the license of each of the respective licensees for a period of one year. Thank you. 
And next on the agenda, you have before you orders 2024-06, 2024-07, and 2024-08 regarding the renewal of Centaur Acquisition LLC doing business as Horseshoe Indianapolis, Hoosier Park LLC doing business as Harris Hoosier Park, and Ameristar Casino East Chicago LLC's casino owner's license renewals, respectively. Horseshoe Indianapolis, Hoosier Park, and Ameristar have all filed the proper paperwork and paid that renewal fee. Previously, by orders 202305, 202306, and 202307, the Commission had approved the written powers of attorney for Hoosier and or sorry, Horseshoe Indianapolis, Hoosier Park, and Ameristar, respectively. These approvals expire upon the renewal of the casino owner's license. And for that reason, all casinos must request renewal of the commission's approval of that written power of attorney concurrently with the request for renewal or present the commission with a new written power of attorney, naming a new trustee in waiting. Horseshoe Indianapolis, Hoosier Park and Maristar have all stated their intent to maintain the existing trustees in waiting and have not presented the commission with any modifications. Approving orders 202406 through 202408 would have the effect of renewing the license and approving the powers of attorney for Horseshoe and Indianapolis, Hoosier Park, and Ameristar for a period of one year. Thank you. And next are vendor renewals. You have before you ordered 202409 and pursuant to Indiana Code section 4-38-6-6, a vendor's license must be renewed each year along with the payment of the $50,000 renewal fee. Each of the following licensees has submitted a timely request for renewal along with the required payment. That's BetMGM doing business as Roar Digital for Belterra, Smarkets Holdings USA Incorporated doing business as SBK Indiana for Rising Star, and PointsBet Indiana doing business for Hollywood. Approving order 202409 would have the effect of renewing the license of each of the respective licensees for a period of one year. And finally, you have before you order 2024-10 and pursuant to Indiana Code section 4-33-24-15 and 68 IAC section 26-3-10, a paid fantasy sports operator license must be renewed each year along with the payment of $5,000 renewal fee. The following licensee has submitted a timely request for renewal along with that payment, and that is Underdog Sports Incorporated. Approving order 2024-10 would have the effect of renewing the paid fantasy sports operator license for a period of one year. Thank you. Questions, commissioners, of Mr. Neal? None. Is there a motion on orders 2024-05 through 2024-10? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Is there a second? Second. A motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, signify by stating aye, please. Aye. Aye. All the contrary, same sign. Hearing that, that motion passes. Mr. Neal. Brown. Byers. Good afternoon, commissioners and executive staff. You have before you orders 2024-11, 2024-12, and 2024-13 which would approve permanent supplier licenses for X Group Holdings, Connections IT, and MSC Gaming, respectively. All three applicants have filed the appropriate applications, fees, and been awarded temporary licenses by the IGC. Commission staff conducted background and financial investigations on each applicant, along with their substantial owners and key persons. Commission staff found no material derogatory information that would affect suitability for any of the applicants. Staff's final reports are included in the confidential commission meeting documents for your review. Approving orders 2024-11, 2024-12, and 2024-13 will grant a permanent supplier's license to the previously mentioned applicants, each subject to their yearly renewals. Happy to answer any questions you may have. have commissioners, if Mr. Brown at all? Uh, hearing none, uh, is there a motion on orders 2024-11 through 13? The motion. There's a motion. Second. Second. There's a motion and a second. Fires. Um, all for the vote. All those in favor of the motion, signify by stating aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Hearing that, that motion uh, carries. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is Director of Sports Wagering, Malia Foster, will now present orders 2024 through 14. Good afternoon. 
Good afternoon, commissioners. You have before you order 2024-14, which would approve the sports wagering service provider license for U.S. Integrity Incorporated. The applicant has submitted the required application and received the temporary license issued by the IGC. Commission staff conducted a background and financial investigation on the applicant and found no derogatory information that would affect the suitability of the applicant. Commission staff's final report on U.S. integrity is included in the confidential commission meeting documents that you were provided. Approving order 2024-14 will grant permanent license to U.S. Integrity Incorporated, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Mr. Foster, ask for a motion on order 2024-14 for U.S. integrity. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? None. I'll call for the vote. All those in favor of the motion, signify by stating aye, please. Aye. 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 Um, contrary, same sign. Hoffman. Um, motion carries. I will look forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Plenary actions. Uh, Ms. Mutton. Actions uh, 2024 15 through 42. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You have before you eight settlement agreements concerning disciplinary actions against licensed suppliers, 12 settlement agreements concerning disciplinary action against casinos, and seven settlement agreements concerning disciplinary action against sports wagering operators. Order 2024 15 is a settlement agreement with Ainsworth Game Technology, wherein the supplier failed to renew a level one occupational license. Ainsworth agreed to a monetary settlement of $2,000. Order 2024-16 is a settlement agreement with American Gaming and Electronics, wherein the supplier failed to obtain commission approval prior to conducting a transfer of ownership. American Gaming and Electronics agreed to a monetary settlement of $2,500. Order 2024-17 is a settlement agreement with Aristocrat Technologies wherein the supplier violated the rules for shipping electronic gaming devices. Aristocrat agreed to a monetary settlement of $1,500. Order 2024-18 is a settlement agreement with Genesis Gaming Solutions, wherein the supplier failed to renew two occupational licenses. Genesis agreed to a monetary settlement of $2,000. Order 2024-19 is a settlement agreement with IGT, wherein the supplier failed to file a level one license application in a timely manner. IGT agreed to a monetary settlement of $1,500. Order 2024-20 is a settlement agreement with Konami Gaming, wherein the supplier violated the rules of the vendor log while performing work at an Indiana casino. Konami agreed to a monetary settlement of $1,000. Order 2024-21 is a settlement agreement with SB Tech Malta Limited, wherein the supplier failed to renew one level one occupational license and two level two occupational licenses. SB Tech agreed to a monetary settlement of $5,000. Order 2024-22 was removed from the agenda. Order 2024-23 is a settlement agreement with the United States Playing Card Company, wherein the supplier violated the rules for shipping playing cards. U.S. Playing Card agreed to a monetary settlement of $1,500. Order 2024-24 is a settlement agreement with Ameristar East Chicago, wherein the casino violated the rules for the Voluntary Exclusion Program. Ameristar agreed to a monetary settlement of $1,500. Order 2024-25 is a settlement agreement with Bally's Evansville and includes three counts. In count one, Bally's violated the rules on the drop process when a patron was allowed in the drop zone. In count two, Bally's violated the rules on the vendor log. In count three, Bally's violated the rules of the Voluntary Exclusion Program. Bally's Evansville agreed to a monetary settlement of $5,500. Order 2024-26 is a settlement agreement with Belterra Casino and includes three counts. In count one, Belterra violated the rules for sensitive keys. In count two, Belterra violated the rules for pro progressive electronic gaming devices. In count three, Belterra failed to timely notify the commission of a termination of an occupational license. Belterra agreed to a monetary settlement of $4,500. Order 2024-27 is a settlement agreement with Blue Chip Casino and includes two counts. In count one, Blue Chip violated the rules for sensitive keys. In count two, Blue Chip violated the rules for live gaming, to fill, live gaming device fills and credits. 
Blue Chip agreed to a monetary settlement of $5,250. Order 2024-28 is a settlement agreement with Caesar Southern Indiana and includes four counts. In count one, Caesar Southern Indiana allowed a minor to access the gaming floor. In count two, Caesar Southern Indiana violated the rules for sensitive keys. In count three, Caesar Southern Indiana violated the rules for the count process. In count four, Caesar Southern Indiana violated the rules for live gaming device fills and credits. Caesar Southern Indiana agreed to a monetary settlement of $9,000. Order 2024-29 is a settlement agreement with French Lake Resort Casino, wherein the casino allowed a minor to access the casino floor on three separate occasions. French Lake agreed to a monetary settlement of $9,000. Order 2024-30 is a settlement agreement with Hard Rock Northern Indiana, wherein the casino violated the rules for live gaming device fills. Hard Rock Northern Indiana agreed to a monetary settlement of $1,500. Order 2024-31 is a settlement agreement with Harris Hoosier Park and includes seven counts. In count one, Harris Hoosier Park allowed a minor to access the gaming floor. In count two, Harris Hoosier Park violated the rules of craps when the box person failed to safeguard assets and properly supervise the game. In count three, Harris Hoosier Park violated the rules for the voluntary exclusion program. In count four, Harris Hoosier Park violated the rules for coin testing electronic gaming devices. In count five, Harris Hoosier Park violated the surveillance rules for electronic gaming devices. In count six, Harris Hoosier Park violated the rules on progressive controller for progressive electronic gaming devices. In count seven, Harris Hoosier Park violated the rules for sensitive keys. Harris Hoosier Park agreed to a monetary settlement of $18,500. Order 2024-32 is a settlement agreement with Hollywood Lawrenceburg and includes two counts. In count one, Hollywood violated the rules for safeguarding assets and violated their internal controls for cage procedures. In count two, Hollywood violated the rules for the voluntary exclusion program. Hollywood agreed to a monetary settlement of $6,000. Order 2024-33 is a settlement agreement with Horseshoe Hammond and includes two counts. In count one, Horseshoe Hammond violated the rules for the count process. In count two, Horseshoe Hammond violated the rules for sports wagering kiosk. Horseshoe Hammond agreed to a monetary settlement of $2,500. Order 2024-34 is a settlement agreement with Horseshoe Indianapolis and includes five counts. In count one, Horseshoe Indianapolis violated the rules for even exchanges. In count two, Horseshoe Indianapolis violated the rules for sensitive keys. In count three, Horseshoe Indianapolis violated the rules for electronic gaming devices on three occasions. One, when an electronic gaming device had revoked software installed. Two, when an electronic gaming device's operating system did not match what was approved to be in the machine in the commission's electronic gaming device database. And three, when an electronic gaming device was placed into service without passing a coin test. In count four, Horseshoe Indianapolis violated the rules for live gaming device inventory closers. In count five, Horseshoe Indianapolis violated the rules for live gaming device bills. Horseshoe Indianapolis agreed to a monetary settlement of $11,000. Order 2024-35 is a settlement agreement with Rising Star and includes two counts. In count one, Rising Star failed to notify surveillance of entry into a sensitive area and of the dealer co toke collection. In count two, Rising Star failed to timely notify the commission of a termination of an occupational licensee. Rising Star agreed to a monetary settlement of $2,500. Order 2024-36 is a settlement agreement with American Wagering doing business as Caesar Sportsbook and includes two counts. In count one, Caesar Sportsbook failed to complete the multiple transaction log in a currency transaction report for a transaction exceeding $10,000 at Bally's Evansville's retail sportsbook. In count two, Caesar Sportsbook failed to timely notify the commission of a termination for two occupational licensees. Caesar Sportsbook agreed to a monetary settlement of $3,500. Order 2024-37 is a settlement agreement with Digital Gaming Corporation Limited doing business as Betway, wherein the operator failed to timely notify the commission of a termination for three occupational licensees. Betway agreed to a monetary settlement of $1,000. Order 2024-38 is a settlement agreement with Betfair Interactive doing business as FanDuel Sportsbook wherein the operator failed to renew 39 occupational licensees. FanDuel agreed to a monetary settlement of $21,000 and to participate in a one-on-one -on -one training session with the commission on how to perform licensing procedures in the commission's occupational licensing system. 
Order 2024-39 is a settlement agreement with Seminole Hard Rock Digital, wherein the operator violated the rules on prohibited participants. Hard Rock Digital agreed to a monetary settlement of $15,000. Order 2024-40 is a settlement agreement with Penn Sports Interactive doing business as ESPN Bet and includes two counts. In count one, ESPN Bet violated the rules on prohibited participants. In count two, ESPN Bet allowed wagering to take place on unapproved events. ESPN Bet agreed to a monetary settlement of $18,000. Order 2024-41 is a settlement agreement with BetMGM doing business as Roar Digital and includes three counts. In count one, Roar Digital violated the rules and their internal controls on responsible gaming limits. In count two and count three, Roar Digital failed to file a level one license application in a timely manner. Roar Digital agreed to a monetary settlement of $7,500. Order 2024-42 is a settlement agreement with Hoosier Park LLC doing business at Caesars Race and Sportsbook Indianapolis and includes two counts. In count one, Caesars Race and Sportsbook Indianapolis allowed an illegal dice game to take place at their property and failed to stop the game and make proper notification to the commission and to the surveillance department at Hoosier Park. In count two, Caesars Race and Sportsbook Indianapolis allowed a minor to access an area where sports wagering was being conducted. Caesars Race and Sportsbook Indianapolis agreed to a monetary settlement of $6,500. Order 2024-43 has been removed from the agenda. Relevant details for each settlement have been provided in your meeting materials. Each settlement agreement will also be available on the commission's website following the meeting. This concludes my presentation. Thank you. Questions to Ms. Button? Her motion on orders 2024. Come on. Is there a second? Second. A motion and a second. Discussion? Chair. Yeah. Accepting orders 2024. Okay. Thank you. Accept, yes. Verification. Uh, fans, uh, all those in favor of the motion, signify by stating aye, please. Aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Uh, motion carries. Occupational license painting room is missed by. Billy, you're back up on the stage again. Occupational licenses. Again. <laughs> Commissioners, you have before you orders 2024-44 through 2024-46 concerning the felony waiver applications of Brian Russell, Ashley Quintain, and Christopher Jordan. An individual who has been convicted of a felony may not be granted an occupational license. However, an applicant who has been convicted of a felony is allowed to request a waiver if they establish by clear and convincing evidence that they have been rehabilitated. Mr. Russell, Ms. Quintain, and Mr. Jordan provided testimony about the rehabilitation, demonstrated ownership of past mistakes, demonstrated that these were isolated incidents in their past, and showed that they successfully completed probation. Detailed information regarding these orders is contained in your confidential commission materials. Adopting staff's findings and recommendations would have the effect of granting Mr. Russell, Ms. Quintain, and Mr. Jordan's felony waiver applications. Questions, plenary actions um, for motion 2024 through 44 through 46. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. A motion and a second. Any questions or discussion? All those in favor of the motion, state aye, please. Aye. Aye. Fine. We have uh, consent. Act and motion approved. You now have before you order 2024-47 concerning an application for occupational license to work for Indiana licensees. With regard to this order, applicant failed to disclose their complete criminal history and or had a felony conviction and therefore failed to meet the established standards for licensure. The applicant was given an opportunity to withdraw their application from consideration but failed to do so. Detailed information regarding this order is contained in your confidential commission materials. Approving order 2024-47 would have the effect of denying the application. Questions? The 
moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Favor the motion, so by stating aye, please. Aye, aye. Aye. All those opposed, same sign. Hearing none, motion carries. Thank you very much. Next, you have before you orders 2024-48 through 2024-54. These orders concern settlement agreements between commission staff and occupational licensees. In lieu of disciplinary action, commission staff offered each of these licensees a settlement agreement that would have them agree to an unpaid voluntary relinquishment of their occupational license for a period of regularly scheduled working days with no vacation or other paid time off to be used. Each of these licensees has agreed to the terms of the settlement agreements. Detailed information regarding each of these matters is contained in the confidential materials that have been provided to you. Approving 2024-48 through 2024-54 would have the effect of ratifying the agreements with the occupational licensees. Questions of Ms. Mueller? Move. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second. Uh, discussion. Here with the motions, signify by stating aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. The motion carries. General you know, matters. <laughs> Deputy General Counsel Alex Dudley will present five concerning casino financing request. Good afternoon, Commissioners, Executive Staff. You have before you order 2024-55 concerning Caesars financing request that was previously ratified at the December 2023 commission meeting. Caesars has requested an extension in the order to close on this financial transaction pursuant to resolution 2017-109. An interim approval of the extension was issued on January 8, 2024. Approval of this order would ratify the interim approval and grant Caesars until the end of June 2024 to close. Questions? Motion on order 2024 uh, 255. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. Any discussion? All for the vote. All those in favor, state aye, please. Aye. 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 All those same sign. Hearing none, the motion carries. <laughs> Mayor of Terre Haute, Mr. Brandon Seckham, will provide now address the commission regarding the CD. ITH local development agreement. Good afternoon, Mayor. Well, good afternoon. Look, I'm, I promise I'm not here to talk about the Indiana State University Sycamores getting snubbed from the NCAA tournament. You won last night. But we did. So I, I certainly hope to see you all this weekend in the second round of the NIT. We got a lot of tickets on sale. So I hope to see everyone in the crowd and, of trees. course, you there. Go trees. Um, you know, five years ago, as we started on this journey and, and Churchill Downs came to the, the city of Terre Haute, uh, we've come a long way. And during this journey, during this process, we have seen a lot of turnover with elected officials in the city of Terre Haute, as well as the county. So on, on behalf of the new administration, from some county members, some city members, uh, I'm here today to say uh, one thank you to, to Churchill Downs for, for being willing to negotiate and conversate about their relationship in the community and, and for truthfully starting to, to live that promise with all the new leadership and, and being that true community partner. We, we really look forward to them opening their doors on April 5th and hope that many Hoosiers across the state and Americans across the Midwest and nation come to Terre Haute, Indiana once that casino is open. We've had a record announcement this past month for a strong public-private partnership in downtown development a renewed relationship with our four institutes of higher education, Rose Holman, St. Mary of the Woods, ISU, and Ivy Tech. So Terre Haute is poised for an exponential growth these next couple of years, and we're looking forward for the casino being a part of that. So thank you so much on behalf of the city of Terre Haute and looking forward to seeing you all here in the next couple of months. Congratulations on your election. Thank you. Uh, we approach again, uh, Mr. Dudley. Agreement. Commissioners, you now have before you order 2024-56 regarding the local development agreement that was entered into by the Board of Commissioners of Vigo County, Indiana, and Churchill Downs Incorporated Terre Haute. The fully executed LDA has been included in your confidential materials. 
pursuant to Indiana Code 4-33-23, approval of Order 2024-56 would have the effect of approving the LDA. Questions on that, commissioners? Or motion on Order 2024-56. Move. Second. Second. Any motion or second? Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, state aye, please. Aye. 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 And signed. Hearing none. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Now I understand we're going to have a presentation, um, Director of Security Gaming. Our continued uh, effort to continue to inform. I made a request uh, some time ago, maybe a year or so ago, that we would listen a little bit more intently so we'd have a better understanding of the inner workings of, of the commission. And uh, now today is uh, a one our charity gaming division. Thank you for allowing us to be here, commissioners, staff, thank you. Uh, charity gaming started in Indiana in 1992. In 1996, four years later, it moved to the Indiana Gaming Commission. It started in the Department of Revenue. The last big thing in charity gaming was 2019 when our statute uh, was repealed and replaced. We rewrote the statute and we uh, moved on down the road. Good, it works. I'm not real good with technology, so I panic every time it happens. Uh, charity gaming division, what we do is we, we enforce the rules and the regs for nonprofits. Uh, charity gaming. Qualified organizations that we have in Indiana, we have about 3,700 charity organizations active in the state of Indiana, and those are served by, by federal organizations, federal organizations, uh, civil, religious, school, and booster athletic organizations. Those are the types of, of organizations that we deal with every day. Types of games that we have, they're going to have bingos, raffles, uh, casino game night, which we call it the cards and dice games. Uh, water races, which is just what it sounds like when you throw ducks or ping pong balls in a river and watch them go down the river. Whichever one crosses first, you get the fastest duck, uh, you win. Guessing games are another thing that we deal with. Guessing game, a good example of a guessing game is uh, dropping golf balls out of a helicopter. Whichever one goes in the hole wins. You buy the golf balls and whichever one goes in, that's a guessing game. The others are pull tabs, punch boards, and tip boards. Pull tabs, you can see in the upper right of the presentation, uh, it's like a lotto ticket. You pop it open. It's got some characters inside, and that will determine whether you win. Punch boards, you punch a hole through a board. Uh, ticket comes out the other side, and that determines whether you win. Tip boards, uh, they, can, they call it tipping off. Uh, they will tip off different types of foods, uh, or it can be anything. It could be anything that they want to tip off. A little bit about our... Our division, uh, we have uh, one administrative assistant. She's pretty busy. She takes care of also the manufacturers and distributors, which we have 49 of those. Uh, to be a licensed distributor in Indiana, you have to go through our process. And we also benefit uh, excise because to have uh, pull tabs, punch boards, tip boards, and that type of stuff in uh, Indiana Bar Tavern, you must first be licensed by us, then go to ATC to get that licensing. Uh, the person, Lisa, who has this position supports our leadership and our licensing council, our attorney that deals with us, and she also in, in, uh, supports our investigative team. Then we have seven program coordinators. The program coordinators in the office every day, they process all of the paperwork that comes in. Uh, they average about 10 years of experience in uh, charity gaming, but they have a lot of experience in dealing with our public. Uh, they're often, we continually get compliments about how nice they are to our people. And, and we joke that it's the kinder, gentler state employee that we hire back there. They're very good at what they do. They're very busy. Like I said, we have 3,700 organizations. And you'll see in one of the slides coming up uh, how many pieces of paper they touch to include reviewing contracts, reviewing agreements between the organizations to make sure everything's passed. Our investigators, we have five investigators. Uh, they average 46 years of law enforcement investigative experience. They're very, very qualified. Uh, many of them have worked in other divisions of the Gaming Commission before coming to us, whether it's on the boats as one of the enforcement officers uh, or uh, they work in gaming control. Of the five, four of them come from other divisions that have worked with us. Uh, they cover a lot of area, a lot of area. 
uh, they can go from 6,200 square miles per person up to 7,400. Each person can be responsible for responding to 631 organizations and, and the uh, person who has a central area has Indianapolis has uh, 1,100. Uh, 400 or so of those are in the Indianapolis area. Uh, they strive to be proactive, but when you do the math, 3,700 organizations and five people, uh, it's hard to be proactive. So they react to a lot of complaints. It's not uncommon for us to get a complaint. Um, my second day back with the gaming commission, I picked up my phone and the complaint was they had a dog win a $35,000 lottery, a $30,000 raffle. Uh, those are the types of things they respond to. The other problem that prohibits them from being proactive is once you go in someplace, they know who you are. And when you walk in, uh, we've had uh, our people playing in locations and they see wrong things going on. And I make a point of walking in and they know who I am. They stop. And then 20 minutes after I leave, they start back up again. And then they try to tell us, well, we didn't know it was illegal. Well, yeah. Okay. Nice try. Uh, but those are the investigations that the uh, that they they put up with on a daily basis. I'd like to, if I can take a second, introduce Kim Barnett, if you would stand up. Kim is our Director of Operations. Heather Onafield is our Assistant Director in our division. Uh, Kim's got 25 years in charity gaming. Started when she was five. You'll pay me to say that later. Uh, she has been there. She has a great wealth of institutional knowledge. Heather's only been with us 10 months. She came to us from FSSA and IDOA. Uh, she is pushing us into a paperless society. Uh, she has, uh, we're, we're getting there. We've got to where we have zero backlog in the program coordinators. Uh, we're going, we're becoming more data driven in our results. Now, just because we have no backlog doesn't mean we don't have anything to do. You'll see in one of the coming in the slides coming up where there's continually there's more things coming in for them. Types of licenses, annual activity license. We have eight licenses and one quasi license that drives us nuts. Uh, the annual activity license allows you to do the games you want to play all week long for a year. Uh, the only exception is bingo and casino game night card nights. You can only do those three nights a week. Uh, you can't do bingo three nights and then card nights. It's three nights total. So if you have that endorsement, as we call it, you've got to choose two nights of bingo, one night of cards, or vice versa. Single activity license allows you to do the games you want to play, one night, one location. Festival activity allows you to play the games you want to play five days in a row. And you can do up to three festivals a year. Convention raffle, uh, we sort of legalized something that was probably illegal for years. If you have a national convention coming into Indiana, you can get a license to do a raffle. Uh, always before, they'd find a local chapter and say, get a license, we want to have a raffle now, or they just did it. Uh, now they can get their own raffle license. Candidates committee raffle, that's a political candidate. It's like Joe Kerr for sheriff. It's not the Lake County Republicans, it's Joe Kerr for sheriff, the individual. They can get a raffle license to conduct raffles. We see these a lot at election times. A lot of those complaints our investigators respond to are these, uh, these types of raffles. Three-year veterans annual activity license. It's something that came up with for veterans and it sounds like a pretty good deal. You get a license for three years. It's a little bit more expensive. Uh, you have a license for three years, but every year, you have to still fill out the same paperwork if you had a single year license. And you still have to pay a anniversary fee that is remarkably to the penny as if you renewed a single year license. Uh, it gets more expensive because in that three year period, anytime you wanna change your workers or your operators, it costs you 25 bucks every time you wanna change it. So it gets a little bit more expensive. But we have about 120 some veterans three year activity license. So it's popular with some. To your casino game night license, here's your Jeopardy question. Um, to do card night three nights a week, you could only be federal or a fraternal organization or a veterans. And in southwestern Indiana, we had a civic group that wanted to play euchre three nights a week. That you didn't allow it. They did what we teach our kids to do. You don't like the law, you change it. They got a hold of their legislator 
and they created a two-year casino game night license for civic organizations. Uh, when the law passed, they applied for it, they got it. Um, 14 months into that two-year license, we called them and said, where's that anniversary fee that we talked about? And they said, the what? We said, the anniversary fee. What do you mean the anniversary fee? We just want to give you the license. No, you're 14 months into it. You got to pay us the anniversary fee. Uh, so we found out that they had played once in the 14 months they had it, and they paid their anniversary fee and surrendered the license back. No one has this license. They are the only people that ever had. So if you're on Jeopardy and that comes up, there you go. Annual affiliate license. This is the national organizations that have an Indiana presence. NRA, Quails, Ducks Unlimited, those are the annual affiliates. And we license the national organization and then their subunits work under their license. Exempt event notification. This is the one that causes a few headaches because by statute, it's not called a license. And it states in there when the license is not needed. Well, if it's not a license, the license isn't needed, but you still need to notify us. And sometimes that gets people confused and they have events and we come knocking, try to make it a little bit easier with them. It is free and it accounts for about 30% of our activity is exempt notifications because it's free. Um, there is no limit on the amount of revenue you can raise, but the limiting factor is the value of the prizes you give away. If the value doesn't exceed $2,500 per event, you can do it under an exempt event. So if it's $2,500, you could do three of those a year under this. And like I said, it's free. It's a one-page application, and we turn it around in 14 days. It's very popular. These are the types of licenses that our program coordinators have looked at, and we've talked about all these. Two of them I'll hit real quick. Well, one of them, special permission bingo. With bingo, you're limited to $6,000, the maximum amount that you can award in prizes per event. If you want to go above that, you can apply for special permission. Uh, we've had a lot of people applying for special permission. We've even had to put some restrictions on it because we had people applying for a $25,000 bingo. And we find out, we get complaints, they didn't pay off their jackpots because they had $7 in their bank account when they started. So what we have started doing is to get special permission, you've got to send us your bank records so we can see that there's a reasonable certainty you can have the money to play it off. Like I said, we're not, uh, even though we're caught up, these are the numbers of activity that we will have every month in charity gaming. Uh, it'll range from like you see 350 up to 800 depending on the month, uh, but our program coordinators are still able to knock this out and keep up with the backlog that we have. This is the revenues. Uh, rumors of our death are, were greatly exaggerated to quote somebody. Uh, you can see where COVID hit us and everything dropped down. Uh, at that time, uh, we didn't know if charity gaming was going to come back because not only with charities, but with a lot of organizations, it's hard to get volunteers. And we just didn't know if they would rebound. The blue line shows the gross gaming revenue for the state of Indiana from our charities. The orange is what they give out in payouts. They, the gray line is what the organizations keep. They keep about 22% roughly, give or take. Uh, but there's a lot of money involved in this for the charities. They do a lot of good things with it. Top 10 in revenue. Uh, the top 10 organizations in 2023, those 10 organizations brought in over 50 million in gaming revenue. They dispersed 44 million in expenses and, and jackpots, which gave them at 5 million each. Uh, just so you know what type of organizations, the top 10, four of them were veterans, three were Knights of Columbus, one was Moose, one was uh, Elks, Eagles, and one was a bait. You look at the organizations, the areas, Indianapolis area took four, uh, Fort Wayne had two, Muncie had one, East Chicago one, um, and Orland, Orland, I think took one, and can't see the other one, don't Not have one. memorized, I'm sorry. But those are the ones that had, they're spread out. And of the, the four in Indianapolis, one of those actually, I must tell you, one of them says Bing, it says Speedway, but I lumped them all together for you now. <clears throat> those are the top 10. What are your questions? I told you this wouldn't take long. Thank you. Very, very, very <laughs> okay. I have one question. Uh, yes. Are obviously you're dealing with tax exempt organizations. Yes. Obviously, you qualify under the IRS code at L. 
What about the individual winners? Are they taxed at the uh, at the individual level? In the the statute uh, was uh, had an addition to it a couple of years ago that requires them to report to the IRS and. Uh, this, it, it, I think it exempted the Indiana Department of Revenue, but it said the IRS, we pushed them to do that. Two of the big things we're looking at is making sure they're, they're paying their taxes and problem gambling. Uh, people don't think of problem gambling being much at, at uh, charity gamings, but if you think of, uh, you know, my parents get 1200 bucks in Social Security and they're playing bingo three nights a week, four weeks a month, and they're dropping 200 bucks each night. It, uh, we're, we're trying to ask all of our organizations to at least be aware of it and have an 800 number. And if somebody approaches, take care of it. Thank you. Any other questions from the commissioners? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Mason, what information do the charity gaming licensees send back to you? That is it, you know, maybe break down, like are they identifying individual winners? So you have names and award amounts. So you're maybe connecting that with Department of Revenue. Are they... What are they required to send back to you or are they not? They're not required to give us the names of the people. If they make distributions to other organizations and other charities, they declare that to us. Uh, but there is no cross-reference on individuals and stuff like that. Uh, they're not required to give that information. And in fact, the statute doesn't require uh, them to donate to other charities unless they hit, we have what they call the 90-60 rule. If 90% of their income for a year comes from ga charity gaming, they have to take 60% of their gross and donate it to other charities. They can't use it themselves. Uh, if they trip that 90-60, that's the only thing that requires them to give it to other organizations. Uh, they can keep it themselves and pay for their, their buildings and their utilities and things like that. And then are all of the different licenses that you mentioned, the eight licenses, do they have to report back the activities of their operations? So if to the the awesome line chart that you put in there, which I appreciate charts, that's all data you're getting back from the licensees on an annual basis as to their financial activity regarding the license they have. So you're getting almost annual information, you're getting annual information that's just driving all this all this data. So they're reporting that to you every time they do a, a, an annual update or a new license or anything like that? They do with all of them except the exempt event. And one of the discussions we'd had with the executive staff just last month is we're going to start requiring them on exempt events to give us feedback. Exempt event was a quick example of people getting involved, uh, seeing if they like it, see if it works for them, see if they can get enough volunteers. Um, and there was nothing in, nothing in there for them to require to send us. There is a form event summary report that all organizations have to fill out after each activity it's up to us to request it back from them. Uh, with the exempt events, uh, there's no reports that they send to us at the end. All of the others, there is. So we're looking at correcting that to where we can get some handle on how much they're making on it. Like I said, it's 30% of our work is exempt events. Uh, we don't know how much, we know what they can give out because it's limited by statute. We just don't know what they can bring in. And uh, like I said, it's very popular. So there's gotta be, gotta be a reason. My last question, I promise. Um, the paperless. I want to ask this. So, when those when those licensing entities re report back, is that through a website, through a secure website? Is it a paper or email driven thing? So, or how did, how are they able to efficiently get you the information without having to fill out tons of paper and either PDF it or send it to you via email or via mail? Currently, everything's paper. We're moving. We're working with IoT. Um, and we're moving to where they can, here's our goal at the end. They can apply for their license, paperless. They can pay their fees online. They can report back to us. What we're wanting them to do is a lot of the things uh, that we will input the data that they give us on paper, we put, got to put that into the system to come up with those stats. We're wanting to have them put that in, put that data in, and then we'll have some, some, uh, some, charts that will look or some some programs that will look at it well this one doesn't look right okay does it is it a typo we're hoping to where we can get everything to be paperless in that nature even our investigations the only thing we've really gone to that's totally paperless now is our our investigations and the reports that they do but we're getting there we're getting there appreciate it director yeah, you're welcome commissioner any other questions uh I'll plug our website for Director Mason. 
uh, mm -hmm. in.gov backslash IGC. There's a lot of great information on charity gaming, including the a, basics. Yeah, we have a publication we put together called Charity Gaming Basics. Uh, I'll give another plug for Cliff Notes since it got me through school most of the time. Uh, it's the Cliff Notes of Charity Gaming. It's it's everything about charity gaming. It's it's 30 pages long, but 15 of those are definitions, and it's from a 30,000 foot view in charity gaming. So I'm, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Any other questions? Having none, I think we're getting close to adjournment. I'd like to suggest that we go to that website uh, to uh, be able to find out when our next commission meeting will be. And it, it's probably going to be on final four day. I'm just telling you. <laughs> 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 but uh, uh, better than that, we'll, we'll have that information available for you, uh, for you to your records and for your uh, attendance. With that, uh, no other questions from staff, commissioners? Meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you.